You are about to experience, Jackson Snyder presents. Direct from the Vero Essene Yehad, a Hebrew Nation radio original program. JSP is a variety show seeking out Jewish and Christian origins, religion, theology and history, and doing so in a fashion that is both educational and entertaining. Welcome to Jackson Snyder Presents. Greetings, this is Jackson coming to you through the Blue Snowflake Microphone. This essay you are about to listen to is a rare treat. It's scholarly, yes. It may be difficult to understand. It might even be boring. But if you're interested in demonology on the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll find our time together is shocked. Some of these texts are narrative works. Information that you probably have not been able to find any place else. There's a lot of repetition in here, and there's a lot of words. But, provides if a short you listen outline carefully of the of demonology and at the same time the think literature. about what you Present know the about demonology in and deliverance in the written tradition, you'll find that things the haven't of the changed influence of so much culture, since 200 B.C. having worked and the in the deliverance of ministry of new for a number of years. With the I read through of the this world and was enlightened about numerous things I did not understand. So it seems like this essay is taking us back to the very first five ten has the times only one of the major scrolls and, and giving minor us ones. the answers to some of the questions of the that have been bothering on us for grounds. years Both of ministry. I find this also an incredible resource BC. for those wanting to, to go into restoration ministry, in the and I and wish I could have known these things 50 years ago. Please, if you have questions or comments, hit me at W www.yahad.me. I would be order and very the role interested of in discussing the main this paper with the glory you. of Elohim, the activity of the righteous, and the works of evil demons in the world. The songs reflect a dichotomous worldview. Elohim is called the King of Glory, Elohim of Knowledge, Adon of the Divine Beings, and Adon of all the Holy Ones. His realm is above the powerfully mighty. However, Elohim is once called El Shaddai, a name used especially in magical texts. Divine beings are also mentioned several times in the hymns. The sage, or masculine, is characterized by the knowledge he receives from Elohim. He loathes the deeds of impurity, that is, practices resulting in impurity. There is a group mentioned in the songs as the associates of the sage. The group is called those who follow the paths of Elohim. This means in Qumran vocabulary, the right interpretation and practice of the Mosaic law, namely, interpretation according to the tradition of the community. Other names for this group are those who know justice and the holy ones. Thus, the group is characterized by knowledge, purity, and holiness, the latter two because of their right practice of the Torah. They receive their knowledge from Elohim. The third element of the system is the demons. They are listed in both exemplars of the work. According to the list, they are spirits of the ravaging angels, the bastard spirits, demons, Lilith, owls and jackals, those who strike unexpectedly to lead astray the spirit of knowledge. The activity of the demons is, according to the songs, not forever, but only for the period of the rule of wickedness and in the periods of humiliation of the sons of light. Periods of human history are often mentioned in several Qumran works, such as Pasher al-Hakisim, 4Q180-81, which is a theoretical work on these periods in human history. The various periods are characterized by the activity of various groups, the righteous or the evil. According to this, they are labeled as periods periods of righteousness or periods of sin. The latter, of course, are periods of oppression for the righteous. So the demons mentioned in the songs of the sage are subject to Elohim's power, and they are mediators of divine plans. 
Next are the Shedim, Lilith, Owls, and Jackals. As to the names and origin of the various categories of demons, some of them are known from the Old Testament, as well as from Syrian and Mesopotamian lore, like the Shedim, Lilith, and Owls and Jackals. Together with Lilith, Owls and Jackals are mentioned as evil spirits dwelling at deserted ruins in such passages as Isaiah 34, 14. Isaiah doesn't inform about Lilith's characteristics. On the other side, Lilith is well known from Mesopotamia Mesopotamian incantation texts and amulets as a night demon killing babies. The incantation series Maklu mentions several times the group. The name Lilithu is to be identified here with that of Lilith, as well as in the incantation text written against the demons of the Lilu family. Lilith is dangerous, above all for newborn babies, sucking their blood and eating their flesh. Her characteristics are very similar to those of the Mesopotamian female demon Lamastu. She is represented on her numerous representations with lion head, female body, bird's legs, holding snakes in her hands, and suckling a dog and swine. Jewish sources derive the name Lilith from the noun Lila, that is night. However, its origin is the Sumerian word Lil, meaning wind. Lilith and her companions are constantly mentioned in the texts of the Aramaic and Mandaean magic bowls from late antiquity. The inscriptions in the bowls serve apotropaic purposes. The adjective apotropaic I define as modifying something supposedly having the power to avert evil influences or bad luck, and I define that for you because it's used quite often in this essay. The majority of the bowls originate from the Jewish community at Nippur. Lilith is well known in Talmudic and later Jewish tradition. Apotropaic texts called Segula, directed against Lilith's harmful activity, have been used in Jewish tradition until modern times. Printed Seguloth from Hungary from the beginning of the 20th century use psalm texts and names of the biblical matriarchs as protection against Lilith, or Lilith in the Old Testament. Without mentioning Lilith's name, Isaiah 13, 21, and 22 lists owls and jackals, ostriches and hairy ones, all of them as demonic beings dwelling among ruins. In the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean, owls are generally connected to death and the demonic. The evil Atuku demons are called owls hooting over the city in a Mesopotamian incantation text. Similarly, the jackal is an animal related to death. A general name of a demonic being is shed, usually mentioned in plural form in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32.17 and Psalm 106.37, for example. The Old Testament mentions other demonic beings besides those mentioned above. Saul's mysterious depressive illness is caused by a bad spirit, Ruach Ra. 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23. Saul evokes the spirit of the dead Samuel with the help of the witch at Endor in 1 Samuel 28. Demonic beings are referred to in texts mentioning Azazel, the Rephaim, and the vampire like Aluka from Proverbs 30, 15. Names of illnesses and afflictions may comprise the meaning of demonic beings like Mashit, Dever, Kitev, Reshep, or the Demonium Meridianum in Psalm 91, 6. Later Jewish tradition shows a rich world of demons. Illnesses and afflictions in the Old Testament narratives are always Elohim's agents for punishing sins. They are never sovereign entities. The use of amulets is also documented in the Old Testament. The moonlets, mentioned in historical and prophetic texts like Judges 8.21, Isaiah 3.18, probably served as amulets. In all probability, jewels like nose rings, necklaces, which were also worn as amulets, and makeup used for apotropaic purposes were meant when the prophet Hosea urged Israel to put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, Hosea 2.2. Golden bells hanging from the high priest's garments, such as in Exodus 28.33, 
and I quote, were in the first instance amulets to frighten evil spirits away, unquote. A tomb from Ketef Himon in Jerusalem from the end of the pre-exilic period provided archaeological evidence for the use of amulets as sacred texts written on silver sheets with protective and apotropaic purposes. The Old Testament has a negative attitude toward magic. The historical narratives of the corpus, possible witnesses of everyday practice, have come down to us through the filter of the Deuteronomistic editors whose opinion was adverse to magic. Accordingly, they tried to eliminate all magical elements. For this reason, references to belief in demons are not obvious. However, behind these laconic reports, there may exist a living but concealed world of beliefs. It's hard to believe that in pre exilic Israel, there was only a limited or temporary belief in demons, confined to an acquaintance only with some demons in certain periods. Belief or non-belief in demons is a vital part of any worldview, and it is never partial or temporary. Ancient Near Eastern cultures attributed illnesses, anxiety, and psychic disorders, afflictions, epidemics, and all kinds of natural evil to the work of demons. This view can be said to be natural since at the time there was no knowledge about bacteria, viruses, other biological causes of illness, or medical theories and concepts that are well known to us. The Hippocratic humoral theory that considers illness a disorder of the balance of humors in human organisms was a revolutionary breakthrough in ancient medicine. However, it occurred only at the turn of the 5th and 4th centuries BC, and Near Eastern medicine had not been influenced by it for a long time. Consequently, the realm of demons was a natural and basic element of the worldview of ancient Near Eastern cultures, including the Israelite culture, from the earliest times to late antiquity. Brother Snyder, Brother Snyder, can't you see I'm right in the middle of this reading? I have a question for you. What is a reverse exorcism? A reverse exorcism? Never heard of that. What is it? Uh, that's when a demon commands a priest to leave the body of a child. Oh. Not in good taste, brother. Not in good taste. Mesopotamian Demonology Ancient Israel's culture is rooted in the Semitic cultures of the ancient Near East. Notwithstanding that Yahwistic monotheism was prevalent in Israel, the worldview and beliefs of Israelites are similar to those of the Syrian Mesopotamian world. The period of the exile was an age of direct contact with that world, a living experience for the exiled. Aramaic language and literacy were mediators between Mesopotamian and Jewish lore. Aramaic was known even earlier as a language of diplomacy. Demonology, magical literature, and healing practice have been well documented in Mesopotamia in literary texts, documents, and art. This is also true for the Neo-Babylonian period, the time of the exile. Jewish Mesopotamian cultural relations continued during the first period of the diaspora. Jewish groups living in Mesopotamia were very well informed of and a part of the political events and culture of their environment. Mesopotamian literary and scientific traditions may have been mediated to the Jewish communities in exile through Aramaic scribes well-trained in Mesopotamian scribal tradition, and able to transmit it in Aramaic. During the first millennium BC, besides copies of works of older cuneiform literature, an abundance of Aramaic texts may have been produced in Mesopotamian scribal offices, works written on parchment and papyrus, therefore not preserved. In order to understand certain phenomena in post-exilic Jewish culture, one has to take into account possible influences of Mesopotamian culture on Jewish thought. The worldview of Mesopotamians was determined by their belief in omina and demons. The basis for the interpretation of Omina was their holistic concept of the world. Heavenly and earthly realms were interrelated, earthly institutions being a mirror form of heavenly ideal plans. They looked for relations between stars and natural phenomena of the heavenly world, which gave rise to astrology. The constellation of heavenly bodies, behavior of animals, especially birds, phenomena of the earth, and dreams were interpreted as predictions of the future. The interpretation of omina, or omens, 
was an everyday praxis in Babylonia. The 4th century Greek author Theophrastus ridiculed the Babylonians for their extreme insistence upon interpreting every phenomena as prognostications of future events. Demons were considered in Mesopotamia as a natural phenomena, an imminent part of the world representing natural evil. They were considered as harmful beings, causes of illness, plagues, and any noxious influence on humans. They counted as the most dangerous spirits, the ethemu, the spirits of the dead, especially those who suffered a violent death or who did not receive a proper burial and offerings following their death. A baby-killing demon called Lamastu, known also under the name Lilithu, was generally known and feared. The demons Liliu and Wardat Lili were types of incubus and succubus who caused erotic dreams and nocturnal seminal emissions. In many cases, demons are simply known by the name of a symptom of a disease such as headache or fever. The fullest description of evil demons and their nature is the series entitled Utuku Lamnutu. It is a manual of demonology, a rich account of demons and ghosts. The demons are agents of illness, fever, and drought. The Utuku is hostile in appearance and is tall in stature. His voice is great. His shadow is dusky, it is darkened, there is no light in his body. The demon dwells in hidden places. Quote, Gaul is always dripping from its talons, his tread is harmful poison. Unquote. They usually roam in bands. They ravage crops like scorching windstorms and spring up on animals and humans. They kill humans, shedding their blood and devouring their flesh, sapping their stamina, incessantly consuming blood. They are indefinitely shaped dim figures. They are children of the earth and the sky god Anu. They are countermeasures of the holistic world. Quote, non-anthropomorphic breed of heaven and earth, a moral outsider sharing neither the burdens nor the profits of civilization, they attack man indiscriminately, not because of his sins, but in order to get by force what they do not get by right, food and drink. The essential characteristic of these demons is that they do not have a cult, so they cannot profit from the cooperation with man on a regular basis, as the gods do. They are not members of the civilized center." Unquote. These demons represent the natural evil in the world, evil that appears in the form of various diseases, mental illnesses, drought, famine, and natural disasters. Demons were considered impure. They were supposed to live in subterranean holes and in desert regions among ruins of houses outside of the city, sites not belonging to the ordered world of humans, localities that were isolated from human communities. Demons' abodes were also rubbish heaps and latrines, places considered as impure, where refuse resulting from disintegration of human bodies, scraps of food, personal objects, and the like were to be found, through which they supposedly developed their noxious influence on humans. Places beside waters and alongside canals were also considered the habitations of demons. Witches allegedly possess the ability to evoke demons and make people ill. Epilepsy and psychotic illnesses usually were considered the result of sorcery and the charms of witches. For that reason, witchcraft and sorcery were considered as especially harmful. The series Maklu was written against the practices of the witch in order to neutralize their charms. Protection of Houses and Persons Humans tried to protect themselves against demons in various ways by protecting the integrity of the human body and hiding or avoiding disintegration. Apertures of the body, like mouth, nose, ears, and eyes, were protected by makeup, that is, antimony for the eyes and red paint for the lips, earrings, nose rings, and necklaces. Tattooing served a similar function. Cylinder seals worn on the neck served not only as sign manuals of their owners, but also as apotropaic objects. They commonly had scenes of the gods depicted on them. The house was defended by similar methods. Gates of official buildings were guarded on both sides by figures of protective spirits, lion or bull, seen by everybody. Smaller apotropaic figurines were deposited at the entrances of private buildings. Clay or wooden figurines were buried under the floor of courtyards, rooms, and thresholds. 
divine artifacts made of metal and stone were placed in brick boxes. Illnesses were healed with incantations designed to remove the curses of sorcerers, chasing away the demon that caused the illness. There were two main categories of healers, the Ashipu and the Asu healers. The first one specified the diagnosis, the second one dealt with the therapy, working also with Materia Medica. Their views concerning the cause of illness were similar, attributing demonic causes to illnesses. Any differences lay in their methods, the Asu using more herbs and Materia Medica. Their relationship was rather similar to that of the doctor and the pharmacist. Demons and Ritual Impurity Systems Belief in demons is a core element in the rationale of the concept of ritual purity. Impurity systems are known from several ancient Near Eastern cultures. In addition to ancient Israel, Syrian, Mesopotamian, Iranian, and Indian cultures were familiar with the idea of impurity and based various systems upon it. Impurity is human-centered in each system. Basic impurities are the bodily, physical impurities of humans. Physical impurities resulted from the organic states or natural human processes like death or menstruation. A theoretical system of impurities in ancient Israel is given in the Priestly Codex of Leviticus. Physical bodily impurities in the Old Testament system are corpses, blood, lepers, and certain bodily emissions, including any flow from genitalia. Whatever contributes to the disintegration of the body is considered physically impure. Belief in demons and impurity systems are related to each other. Whatever is impure is receptive to demonic influence and vulnerable. Humans attempt to impede the spread of impurity as a method of defending against the pernicious influence of the demonic world. The Story of the Watchers Rationale for the Origin of the Demonic in the Post-Exilic Age an expression in 4Q5, 10, and 11 designates demons. Bastard spirits and ravaging angels probably originated in the Enochic tradition where the Watchers had illicit sexual relations with earthly women. The Book of Enoch was known early as a part of the pseudepigraphic tradition in Greek and Ethiopian translations. Its original language may have been Hebrew or Aramaic. The Greek translation was based in these texts, but only a part of it has survived. Fortunately, the Ge'ez, or Ethiopian translation, has preserved a much longer text. The work known only in translation is uniformly dated to the middle of the 2nd century BC. Some parts of it, especially chapters 37 to 70, are dated to a somewhat later time. The finding among the Qumran texts of fragments of the Aramaic original of 1st Enoch produced a veritable revolution in Enochic research. The admittedly minute manuscript fragments found at Qumran not only answer certain important questions about the history of the origin of the text, but also provide insight into the role the text played in the literary tradition of the group that hid the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves. Based on the number of fragments found, one may suppose that the work was not only known at Qumran, but that it must have been an important work in the tradition of the community. This is also indicated by the fact that numerous other works found at Qumran, and in some cases already known from the pseudepigraphic literature, contain a similar tradition to that known from First Enoch or refer to First Enoch. No fragments of the parables of Enoch, chapters 37 to 70, were found at Qumran. It's thought that these chapters are of later origin than the other parts of First Enoch. The Qumran manuscripts, however, also contain fragments of the astrological book and Book of Giants, not known from any translation prior to the discovery of the Qumran cache. The oldest Qumran manuscript of 1st Enoch, that is 4Q Enoch, may be dated to the end of the 3rd century BC, and already this manuscript contains the texts of chapter 1 through 12. Most likely, the entire book of Watchers, that is chapter 1 through 36, belongs to the Slayer. The later manuscripts contain more of that work. This indicates that the work was continually transmitted until the 1st century BC, and that in the course of this transmission, the collection was enriched by additional pieces. The manuscript tradition can be traced to the turn of the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. This means that the Book of Watchers was written at least during the 3rd century BC, and it may have been written even earlier. First Enoch and Mesopotamian Tradition 
Enoch was written in Aramaic, the vernacular in Mesopotamia, by the time of the exile. Besides First Enoch, several works composed in Aramaic come to light from the Qumran library. They manifest several specific common characteristics concerning their literary genres and content. These are worthy of further examination. Several Qumran Aramaic works are well acquainted with historical, literary, and other traditions of the Eastern Diaspora, and they contain Mesopotamian and Persian elements. First Enoch reflects a solid awareness of certain Mesopotamian traditions. Revelations on the secrets of the cosmos given to Enoch during his heavenly voyage reflect the influence of Mesopotamian cosmological lore. The figure of Enoch... The figure of Enoch and the elements of the Revelation tradition associated with him originates in the figures of Mesopotamian Apkalu, wise ones, more exactly in the figure of the Mesopotamian divine king Amadoranki, and in the tradition about divine revelation given to him. This can be assumed that the kernel of the Enochic tradition, that is 1 through 36, was shaped either in a Babylonian Jewish diaspora community, or perhaps in a community of returnees that maintain traditions from the Babylonian exile. This group of writings might have been expanded by later additions to the text. The narrative of the Watchers, chapters 6 through 11, belongs to the earliest textual layer of First Enoch and represents one of the earliest traditions of the collection. In chapters 6 through 11, two distinct narratives exist the narrative on Shemehaza and that on Aziel or Azazel, the Shemehaza tradition. The bulk of this early tradition is contained in the Shemehaza story, 1 Enoch 6, 1 through 7, 62. According to the Shemehaza story, a group of the sons of heaven, whom the text refers to as the Watchers, glimpse the daughters of men, desire them, and decide to descend to them. Their leader, Shemehaza, considers the plan to be sinful. He does not want to bear the responsibility alone. Therefore, the Watchers, in order to fulfill their plan, swear to unite on Mount Hermon. Then the Watchers, and I quote, to defile themselves with them, and they begin to teach them sorcery and spellbinding and the cutting of roots and to show them plants. The women became pregnant from them and bore children who became giants. The giants, and I quote again, were devouring the labor of all the children of men, and men were unable to supply them. After this, the giants began to devour men, and then, quote, they began to sin against all birds and beasts of the earth and reptiles and the fish of the sea and devour the flesh of one another, and they were drinking blood. Then the earth made the accusation against the wicked concerning everything that was done upon it. That's in 7, 5 through 6. These, then, are the transgressors, which finally bring about the punishment of the flood. First Enoch 9. Thus the story serves as a justification for the catastrophic punishment wreaked upon humanity. As a L story, in First Enoch 8, 1 through 2, does not retell the story of the Watchers. It's focused upon and limited to different data concerning such details as the name of the leader of the revolt and the teachings of the Watchers. Here their leader is called Azael or Azazel. He taught metalworking, making weapons and jewels for men, and the knowledge of eyeshadows, of precious gems, and dyes of mineral origins for women. The section on Azael's teaching is followed by a report on the teachings of Semehaza and his companions. They taught the interpretations of heavenly omina, each watcher teaching the signs of the natural phenomenon that was included in his name. The whole section ends with the report on the punishment of Azael and the watchers. Azael was punished by the angel Raphael for the sin Azael perpetrated. He was bound and cast into darkness, where the watchers will stay until the great day of judgment. Enoch 10, 4 through 7. On the other hand, the punishment mentioned in the Semahaza story is the binding of Shemihaza and his companions by Mikael for 70 generations, after they were forced to witness their children, the giants, perish. The devastation of the flood following these events signifies the purification of the earth. The narratives on Shemihaza, Asael, and the flood revolve around the problem of the origin of evil. 
The Shemehaza narrative is similar to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, which is also connected with the flood. The relation of the two stories is complicated. The story of Shemehaza and his companions is a logical and continuous narrative, whereas Genesis 6, 1 through 4 seems to be a series of theological reflections on the story narrated in First Enoch. As to the background and meaning of the story of the Watchers, earlier theories saw historical and mythological motifs behind the narrative. The motif of the integration of heavenly and earthly beings would have referred to and negatively judged the mixed marriages of the priests in the post-exilic era objected to by Ezra. The motif of the bloodshed would have mirrored the wars of the Diadoche. Other theories look for mythological models, seeing the motif of the teaching of the Watchers as modeled after the myth of Prometheus, Asiel being a protos heretes. Of course, neither historical, sociological, nor mythological models, including Greek images, can be ruled out. However, observation of only one or two motifs of the narrative does not illuminate the background and meaning of the whole story. Many elements of the story, such as cannibalism and consuming blood, the basically negative nature of the teachings of the Watchers, magic and interpretation of Omina, are left unexplained. In order to ascertain the background and the exact meaning and message of the narrative, all major elements of the narrative must be considered. This can be followed by a discussion of the issue of foreign literary influences. The tradition of the Watchers was a relevant theme in Qumran literature. It was often cited and referred to in other works, certainly because the meaning of the story was considered relevant for the spiritual world of the community. Supposedly, the story had a specific meaning for them, and its motifs embodied basic ideas of the Essene tradition. Notions that are related to each of the motifs of the story are those of sin and impurity and magic and the demonic. Sin and impurity, ethical, prohibited impurities. The purity system of the Old Testament is acquainted not only with physical impurities, but also ethical ones. Ethical impurity grows out of the situations that are controllable and are not natural or necessary, such as delaying purification from physical impurity, polluting specific holy things, sexual transgressions, idolatry, and murder. The locus of uncleanness may be the person, but proscriptions refer for more to the pollution of the sanctuary or land. Punishment of these sins are more severe than the consequences of physical impurities. Punishment of the sinner is usually the banishing or driving away from the land or the extinguishing of one's family. Karet, cutting off. The main list of ethical impurities is the Holiness Code of Leviticus 17 through 26. Sins related to sexual relations are cases of the zenut, usually translated as fornication, that is, all kinds of illicit sex, sex among blood relatives, with another's wife, homosexual relation, sex with menstruating women, and prostitution. A special case in the list is kilayim, the prohibition of mixing together different kinds of animals, plants, and materials in human clothing. A special case of zenut, not listed in Leviticus 17 through 26, is remarriage with one's divorced wife, she having in the meantime been remarried and then divorced or widowed. Deuteronomy 24. Second, sins related to blood, bloodshed. Third, sins related to the dead, corpse left on the tree for night. 4. Sins related to magic. Quote, Do not resort to ghosts and spirits or make yourself unclean by seeking them out. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Leviticus 19.31 Magical practice is sometimes conceived as zenut, and those who practice it are to be killed. Results of ethical impurities are summarized in Leviticus 18.27-30. Quote, the people who were there before you did those abominable things, and the land became unclean. So do not let the land spew you out for making it unclean as it spewed them out. Observe my charge, therefore. Unquote. Qumran texts enrich the biblical theory of impurities. Sin and impurity in the story of the Watchers. The sins of the Watchers are their transgression of the cosmic order and mixing with earthly women and their teaching of magic. They became impure by the process. The Book of Giants qualifies their relation as a case of zenut, 
one of the main categories of ethical impurities. On an ontological basis, the mixing of heavenly and earthly beings can also be a violation of the kilim, prohibition of the mixing of categories. Practice of magic is again an ethical impurity according to the biblical system. The sins of the giants, sons of the watchers, are violence, bloodshed, cannibalism, sins against the animals, birds, and fishes, and drinking of blood. Homicide is among the sins that make the land impure. Cannibalism is not known from the biblical system. The meaning of the sins committed against the animals isn't clear. It can be a violation of the prohibitions concerning food. This presupposition is confirmed by the report on their consuming of blood, which is a violation of the biblical prohibition of Genesis 9, 3, and 4. These are the sins of the watchers and their offspring that made the earth impure. The resultant flood is not only a punishment of these sins, but at the same time a purification of the earth, the giants in the Enochic tradition. 1st Enoch 15.8 refers to the offspring of giants as demons, Ethiopic nafsat, Aramaic ruach. These beings are spiritual in nature, following their father's nature. They do not eat, they are not thirsty, and know no obstacles. Their destructiveness first and foremost affects the children and women as they were born of women. The giants are the protagonists of the Book of Giants. The Aramaic fragments belonging to the Enochic manuscripts from Qumran are not contained in the Greek and Ethiopic translations. According to the narrative of a Qumran fragment, one of the giants took to the air, quote, as whirlwinds, and he flew with his hands, wings, as an eagle. According to this, giants were shaped like human figures that could fly like whirlwinds. The Story of the Watchers and Demonology Although the story of the Watchers doesn't mention any demons, the motifs of the story are related to the realm of the demonic. The characteristics of the giants evoke the Mesopotamian tradition about the Utuku, a term generally used for demonic beings. The Enochic giants have the same characteristics as the Mesopotamian demons. They're tall and obtrusive beings, roaming in bands, attacking their victims indiscriminately. They ravage the work of humans, devour the flesh of animals and humans, and consume their blood. They are born from a sexual union of heavenly and earthly beings considered in the Enochic story to be impure. It is to be noted here that the name and figure of Gilgamesh one of the giants of the Book of Giants can be interpreted in light of the magical tradition of the Near East. This name, that is known also in Greek magical papyri, is still referred to today in magical incantations, binding the watchers. The punishment for the sins of the watchers is binding them and casting them into darkness. Azael is bound by the angel Raphael. Shemahaza is bound by Mikael. Demonological texts regularly mention that the demon is binding his victim. The witch, a constant figure of the Mesopotamian incantation series, Maklu, binds her victim by her practices. The binding effect of the witchcraft is mentioned in the title of a series of incantations entitled The Pregnant Woman Who Was Bound. The bonds made by witches can be solved by another kind of magic, healing incantations. Just as an aside, I certainly don't consider those things to be magical. But we're dialoguing with a scholar here who, if they want to make the grade, is limited to a certain so-called scholarly vocabulary. Binding is a constant motif in the Mesopotamian creation myth and Numa Elish, in which the triumph of the gods over their demonic enemies is marked by binding the enemies. Triumphant Ea binds Apsu, the primitive ocean, and builds his house over his breast. He also binds Apsu's helper, Mumu. Marduk binds Tiamat, then splitting Tiamat in two, he forms the netherworld in the monster's inner part. Sorcery. In the Shemihaza story, the Watchers teach humans magical practices, sorcery and spellbinding, and the cutting of roots, and to show them plants. 1 Enoch 7. The first two nouns are general terms for magical practices. The cutting of roots means, in all probability, the making of herbal ingredients for magic and making amulets containing herbs and roots. Metallurgy. Azel and his companions teach men metallurgy, the making of weapons and jewels. To the women, they teach makeup and cosmetics, the most precious and choice stones, and all kinds of colored dyes. 
metallurgy, and smithing are very closely related to the notion of magic. Iron smiths are considered sorcerers in the belief system of the ancient and modern Near East. Weapons made by forgers were attributed to magical power. Jewels served originally as amulets with apotropaic function. Cosmetics. The ancient magical origin of makeup, especially the painting of eyes and lips, is well known. Similarly, the magic of jewels. In Enuma Elish, the Mesopotamian creation myth, all the gods at war wear amulets, using their magic power against their enemies. According to the myth of Ishtar's descent into the netherworld, the fertility goddess going to the netherworld must, at each gate of the netherworld, part with one piece of her seven magical powers, represented by her garments and jewels. At the end of her journey, she arrives naked and powerless before Eresh Kigal, the lady of the netherworld. In the Sumerian variant of the myth, two pieces of Ishtar's cosmetics and jewels are mentioned as having the specific power of sexual attraction. Her mascara called, Let a man come, let him come, and her pectoral called, Come, man, come. Interpretation of Omina, or Omens. The holistic worldview of the Mesopotamians considered everything an omen for future events, an interpretation of onima was generally practiced. Interpretive traditions were collected and systematized in a series of interpretations. A collection of interpretations on heavenly phenomena and meteorological omina can be found in the series Enuma Anu Enlil from the Neo-Babylonian era. Its content is similar to the teachings of Shemiaza and his companions, referred to in the Enoch story. The story of the Watchers as a myth of the origin of evil. The story of the Watchers is a myth on the origin of evil in the world. According to the narrative of the Enochic collection, this is the first event following the creation, remembering that the material of Genesis 2-5 to is not included in the Enochic collection. The first stage of the birth of evil is dysfunction in the cosmic order, the mixing of heavenly and earthly beings. Sins of heavenly beings are designated as ethical impurities. Therefore, the deeds of the Watchers are considered in the narrative to be ethical impurities. Initiators of the sins are the heavenly beings who descend to the earthly women, driven by their desire. The Watchers are conscious of the nature of their deeds. They even agree together to commit the sin collectively. The narrative does not mention human responsibility. The authors and agents of the deeds are the Watchers. The giants, the beings born from a cosmic dysfunction, initiate further anomalies in the world. These anomalies are ethical sins resulting in the defilement of the earth. Impurity of the earth results in the punishment of the flood. The story of the Watchers is an independent story. It is a parallel to the narrative of Genesis 6, 1-4 about the angels and the daughters of men and not an interpretation of Genesis 6, 1-4. The story of the Watchers contains a message that cannot be found in Genesis 6. It is a deterministic myth and an alternative tradition to the message of the primeval history of Genesis. In the Enochic collection, evil originates from the deeds of the Watchers, following the creation. In Genesis, the origin of evil is the human fall into disobedience. Genesis 2 and 3. The tradition of the Watchers is often referred to in Qumran texts, with the implication that here is the origin of evil. On the other hand, the biblical story of the fall is almost never mentioned at Qumran. One Enoch is a theoretical work. The origin of evil means the origin of the demons, causes of natural evil. It seems that the authors of the Enochic story use Mesopotamian lore in a conscious manner. Evil in First Enoch is equal to sin and impurity. The bearers of evil and impurity are demonic beings, the offspring of the Watchers. Demons are working in world history. The story of the Watchers, 1st Enoch 6 through 11, was written following the Babylonian exile. The Terminus ad quem is the end of the 3rd century BC. 
Its language is Aramaean, the vernacular of Mesopotamia, and the lingua franca of the exiled Judeans from the 6th century BC. The figure of Enoch and the revelations given to him reflect a working knowledge of the Mesopotamian traditions about the Apkalu, the antediluvian sages, a priestly tradition from the city of Eridu. Mesopotamian elements in the Enochic literature are not simply a matter of borrowing. Mesopotamian lore was adapted and built into a Jewish system of thought. The message of the story of the Watchers is determined by a monotheistic worldview, backgrounded by the biblical system of ritual purity. Beliefs concerning demons may not have been unknown among the exiles. However, everyday practice of the interpretation of Omena and the magical healing rituals were new for them and may have produced a kind of culture shock. The Enochic narrative interprets the existence of demons as the origin of natural evil. However, the existence of demons is not disclaimed. They are simply regarded as the evil part of the world. The phenomenon that is considered Enoch absolutely negative is magic and its various forms, the interpretation of Omena and the evil teachings of the Watchers. These are all experiences the exiles would have known from everyday Mesopotamian practice. Phenomena and ideas are not explained at the time when they come into being or practice, but when a community senses for some reason a need to explain them, and has time for reflection upon them. The Babylonian exile was such a situation that demanded from the exiles a restatement of their identity. A vital part of reshaping their self-identity was their attitude toward the new cultural heritage to which they were exposed in the exile. Their incorporation and restatement of the Mesopotamian perspectives was, at the same time, a distancing of themselves from certain phenomena of the foreign culture. At the same time, this does not mean a denial of the existence of a demonic realm and the rejection of apotropaic methods. Second Temple Jewish literacy, including Qumran, is especially rich in evidences of belief in demons. Narratives and magical texts from this period reflect the variegated methods used against harmful spirits. The Book of Jubilees The early tradition of the Watchers surfaced not only in the later parts of the Enochic collection, it can be found in other works that survived in Qumranic written tradition and that were obviously important in the community's spiritual worldview. The Book of Jubilees can be dated to the middle of the 2nd century BC. Like one Enoch, it survived in a shorter Greek and longer Ethiopic text. Jubilees was also thought to have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic. A group of Qumran Hebrew fragments, most from Cave 4, was identified as fragments of the Hebrew original of Jubilees. The spiritual milieu of Jubilees was not far from Qumranic views, it seems. This is strongly suggested by the large number of copies of Jubilees in the Qumran library and the influence of Jubilees on other writings preserved in the community's written traditions. The relationship of the 364-day calendar of Jubilees with calendars documented from other Qumran works like 11QT and 4QMMT is generally known. Jubilees is one of the earliest examples of the genre of rewritten Bibles, retelling narratives of Genesis with both lacunae and additions. At the same time, Enochic tradition is systematically absorbed into Jubilees. In Jubilees, Elohim creates angels when creating the world, and the angel of the divine presence, the angel of the holiness, and the angels over the works of the cosmos and the natural phenomena, according to the story of the Watchers told in Jubilees 5, 1-19, the Watchers were angels who came to earth in order to teach righteousness, but their intention turned to the opposite, according to Jubilees 4.15. The children born from angels and earthly women became giants. At the same time, they had nothing to do with the sins that began to spread following their birth. Jubilees does not speak about further offspring of the angels and giants. Following the flood, impure demons begin to lead astray the children of Noah's sons, leading them into folly and destroying them. 
Jubilees 10. The demons were leading astray and blinding and killing Noah's grandchildren. Following this, the text states that the demons originate from the watchers. On the effect of Noah's prayer, yod heh vav bound nine-tenths of the demons. He allowed one-tenth to work in the world under Mastima's leadership. Jubilees presents a hierarchical world of supernatural beings. One of the functions of the demons is the same as in the earlier tradition. They cause illnesses, afflictions, and death. The demons attacking Noah's grandchildren evoke the figures of Lilith-type baby-killer demons. At the same time, new motifs appear concerning demons. They cause blindness and error. In all probability, blindness is meant figuratively, not literally. Blindness is mentioned among the illnesses regularly enumerated in incantation texts or in other texts relating to demons. Blindness, mentioned together with error, is a metaphor that cannot be associated with children, only with adults. Blindness as a metaphor of spiritual error and improper religious practice is a topic that pervades Qumran literature. Mastema is again a character different from that of the demons causing illness. I hate to stop now, but time is up. If you want to catch the rest of it, go out to YouTube, youtube1.org. According to the etymology of his name, he is the instigator, raising animosity. The figure is akin with Satan of the book of Job, the Ben Elohim Job's testing, Job 1. In Jubilees, Mastema is the leader of the demons in Noah's time. Subsequently, in the Jubilees narrative, Mastema appears alone, and always as the instigator. In the time of Ur, Chesed's son, Jubilees 11, 5-6, and then in Terah's days, Jubilee 11, 10, and 12, in the time of Abraham, unclean demons led by Mastema ruled the world. These demons are described as descendants of the fallen angels in Jubilees 19. Abraham has power over the demons. The source of his power is his righteousness. He is not only unwilling to sacrifice to idols while living in the city of Ur, but he sets the house of idols on fire in Jubilees 12. The biblical story of the binding of Isaac is again reformulated in Jubilees. The attempt at sacrifice is here upon the request of Mastema. He is the one who asks Elohim to test Abraham's faith. Jubilees 17. He intends to kill Moses on the way back from Midian. Jubilees 48. And Mastema helps the Egyptian wizards, Moses' rivals, in Egypt. Jubilees 48. Evil and demons in Jubilees represent traditions of varied origins. The basis of the idea of the little type baby killer demons of Jubilees 10 is the general belief in demons causing infant mortality and childbed fever. That they lead to error and spiritual blindness is a scholarly assessment, perhaps even speculation, that expresses the demonization of a religious practice considered to be wrong. There is no demonic figure in Oriental folklore that parallels this j Jubilee's perspective. Mastema's figure is that of the instigator, a relative of the Satan of the Old Testament. At the same time, Mastema is not an independent power. It's not Mastema who tests people, but Elohim. Elohim has power over Mastema, like his power over the angels. At the same time, Mastema is a dangerous enemy, the chief demon in Jubilees. As indicated above, in Jubilees, the motifs connected with demons have various sources. The folk belief, Enochic tradition, scholarly explications, and the tradition about Satan. These characteristics derived from the various roots are merged and presented in the figures of demons in the Book of Jubilees in a hierarchy and in a historical perspective. Returning to the demonological system of the Song of the Sage, 4Q, 5, 10, and 11, it can be ascertained that not only demons of folk beliefs like Lilith, owls, jackals, and demons of the Enochic tradition, bastard spirits, are known in the work, but also spirits of error derived from jubilees have shaped it. Opposition of pure and impure, light and darkness, associated with human and the demonic world, are also evident in other works from the Qumran Library. Gotta go, my friends. If you made it through that whole thing, congratulations to you. 
If you enjoyed it, I'd sure like to talk to you about it. Who do I have to talk to about things like this? No one but myself, and maybe you. That's it for Jackson Snyder Presents, and this is the end and seventh episode of my presentation of The Nephilim. You have been listening to Jackson Snyder Presents on Hebrew Nation Radio.